visiting us um, from Brussels, where she works as the head of the coordination unit on um, of the Bureau of uh, European Policy Advisors for the, pre for the current president. Um, and she's worked there since 2007. And, um, and there she manages financial and human resources and coordinates the unit's activities. Um, she also coordinates events for the president, um, events with think tanks, among, other, among many other things that, um, that the unit, you know, uh, that the unit does. In the past, Ms. Colombo has served the European Commission as a member of the cabinet for Commissioner Vivian Redding and on the Bureau of European Policy Advisors and a Secretariat General in the Unit of Coordination of Policies. She also served as the Directorate General of Agriculture for Veterinary Public Health Legislation and the Directorate of General of Health and Consumer Protection Unit for Biological Risk. She dealt with issues on international negotiations for the World Trade Organization's sanitary and phytosanitary agreements, the mad cow disease crisis, the 1999 dioxin crisis, and the CMO. Um, so her other, um, her other employment has included um, veterinary medicine. She was a veterinarian for 10 years for the government of Italy, um, where she worked in meat inspection and, um, and, and other, you know, um, other places where there are large animals that need to be cared for. Um, and she was also an official for local health um, in Lombardia, and she was a functionaire in the veterinary service of Lombardia. Um, she was also a lecturer at the University of Milano, where she earned her master's in veterinary medicine. Um, and she's a proud veterinarian by training. Um, and now she works in, in, although now she works in the, the European Commission, she kind of maintains but at my age, uh, it's something like that. So, to complete uh, the presentation, uh, the kind presentation, uh, I start with this first slide, because as you know, in Europe, uh, we are living uh, in an historical moment where uh, the Barroso mandate uh, ended uh, last week, uh, and we have now a new European Commission with a new president, Jean-Claude Juncker, and uh, I would like to draw the attention of the speeches that I personally take on last Saturday. And it's unique because, it, as you can see, they were stealing, uh, they're literally unveiling the banners from the Bergamo building, uh, which include uh, the pictures of the president, of the seven vice presidents that are surrounding him with the big novelty of this commission and uh, not yet uh, all the face of the other commission, and as you can see, the little man is still uh, uh, putting the banner on. Uh, the other thing uh, is that uh, uh, any new president needs to mark his territory. So one of the first things that they do is to change the name to the service where I work. The service where I work uh, was created by Delors, the Jacques Delors, and since then, each president keep it and change the name. So I left Brussels that I was working for BEPA, the Bureau of European Policy Advisors, and since last Wednesday, I'm working in the, I must read it, European Political Strategy Center. So the sign that time is moving. So today, I would like to talk to you about uh, the US, Europe, and uh, the management of risk in a complex world, which is quite a topical subject, uh, as uh, it is, in fact, uh, at the core of the discussion that we are having uh, on the transatlantic trade uh, and investment partnership. You know that we are currently negotiating uh, this very ambitious trade agreement. It's not the first time that we are negotiating trade agreement with the United States, by the way. And uh, the global aim uh, is removing trade barriers on a wide range uh, of economic sectors, or you call it opportunities. 
but it threw back uh, the more difficult discussion, uh, and this is historic, an historical problem, the more difficult discussion that we are having now in the United States are about this sector, the sanitary and phytosanitary sector, which means food safety. Uh, this uh, sanitary and phytosanitary means law, rules, standards, and uh, protecting human, animal, plants from uh, contaminant disease. But we are really talking about uh, food safety policy. And uh, we have this uh, regulatory convergence agenda, which tries to bring closer the EU and US standard on food safety. But, and I'm quoting my new president, Jean-Claude Juncker, this will not be done by sacrificing Europe's safety, health, social, and data protection standards on the altar of free trade. So we are setting already the principle that uh, both parties are not going to give in whatever measure, safety measure, they deem appropriate to maintain uh, the level of protection, of health protection that they define. Nevertheless, NGOs, both in the US and in Europe, are very much concerned with what's going on, fearing that uh, eventually this trade agreement will lower indeed consumer standards. And this is part normal because uh, we are trying to make all this very transparent. We try to communicate this to citizens on both sides of the Atlantic, but it's a negotiation. And by definition, negotiations are done, are done at door close. So this is giving the feeling that something fishy is going on uh, and nobody feels comfortable. What I would like to do now is to present to you the EU food safety policy, uh, to highlight where the difference are between the US and the EU. Um, the EU food safety policy is probably the biggest policy that we have uh, in European level uh, uh, because uh, we have a very strong legal basis which has allowed us to regulate everything at community level. So this is the big legislative corpus that we have uh, at European Union level. And uh, it's also important because it's de facto dealing with the first manufacturing sector in the US economy. I think in the US is more or less the same. And uh, I would like you to retain two things about this line. First of all, that the European Union is at the same time exporter importer of food. And most importantly, the differences from the US um, is still dominated by a small medium enterprise. So we don't have the same level of concentration uh, that you have in the US, especially on farming. We have concentration on retailing now, but uh, uh, the food manufacturers are still on the artisanal family side. And this is also important uh, to retain because it makes you understand why EU uh, food safety policy evolved uh, in a certain and here we are on the precautionary principle. The, one of the pillars of our food safety policy is uh, this principle, which can be translated in a better say than sorry, is basically a legitimate option to risk manager when decision has to be made uh, to protect health, uh, but where science is inconclusive. So in other words, uh, is a common sense principle, which is allowing the risk manager to err on the side of safety whenever science uh, is a bit uh, faulty. Is uh, legitimate because, first of all, is in our treaty, the Treaty of the European Union, but by any means is also in the World Trade Organization agreement in the sanitary and phytosanitary agreement is also in the United States subscribed as many other trade partners. And is also included in the mandate for negotiation of the CPLC. The pl 
Kashmir principle is very much controversial. Uh, we Europeans are accused to abuse of this principle or misuse this principle for protectionist reasons, for example. Uh, there is also this uh, perception that we in Europe are more risk adverse than you in the United States, which is not true, and I will go on back to this uh, later. But first of all, uh, let's see why we risk, at least don't mistake the unmatterment, uh, we are a bit more risk adverse than you. But there are reasons, there are historical, there are political reasons, and I would like uh, to go through them through a short history, which is very interesting, because it's not only the history of two states, it is the history of Europe in reality. So you can divide this history in four periods. The beginning, this picture, I love it, is giving you <laughs> a clear image on how important was agriculture at the very beginning, here is 71. But in reality, the common agriculture policy was entered into force in 1962. It sat very high in the political agenda of the Commission, of the six member states, uh, the, found the, sh the founding father. And uh, the first commodities which were traded were agriculture goods. So live animal and product derived from animal, meat, eggs, milk. This is why the first new food hygiene rule was adopted in 1964. Uh, this picture, just to complete, uh, I like the poker face of the Secretary General of the Council. <laughs> I mean, look at him. He's pretending that he's not sitting behind the cow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's also telling you about security in the, in the 70s, because now to enter in the Council, uh, they take a radio fingerprinting, uh, you know, you have to show documents. At the time, you can go with your cow along. <laughs> <laughs> so despite uh, having these first rules, uh, member states were still playing games. They were, in technical uh, jargon, they were applying non-trade barriers to protect their own uh, goods. For example, for example, I say only for example, France wouldn't allow Irish beef on ground that there was tuberculosis in Ireland. This is a typical non-trade barrier. So member states decided uh, that it was not any longer tolerable, and this is why they co-signed a white paper on internal market and the single European market. And everybody agreed uh, that by end uh, of 1992, the internal market was going to be complete. Free circulation of goods, people um, in uh, all uh, the enlarged by then uh, Europe. It was the Europe at 16. And it was done. Look, this is another uh, incredible picture because you can see a lot of people, which is not any longer with us. There is Margaret Thatcher. The Queen of Rugby was the president at the time uh, uh, of Italy, the Prime Minister of Italy. Still alive, Jacques Delors, the president of the Commission. And uh, it went very well. I remember the period. Uh, there was an incredible production of legislation. In 92, everything was done. And we spent, uh, I was still in Italy at the time, and we spent uh, peaceful years uh, transposing this legislation, implementing this legislation. Everything was fine until 1992. We had a range uh, of food safety and not only crisis, starting from 1992. Uh, someone said that it's not a coincidence that I joined the commission in 1995, and since then uh, there was extreme uh, of disaster one after the other. But in fairness, I have to deal with most of them, so I pay if I was the guilty one. The first one was mad cow disease. This was uh, the no return point 
because this will really will shake uh, Europe and consumers in Europe. Um, the date uh, is uh, the date in which uh, the agriculture, the British agriculture prime minister say that uh, metal disease was in fact uh, the reason of the human variation of the disease, the new project jump or something. And this was traumatic, not only because uh, the epidemiologists at the time were saying that basically all British people were going to die. So this was the message. None of you, none of you is safe. You ate beef in the UK, you will die <laughs> of this atrocious disease. I remember we were sent uh, over to the UK in a mission from Brussels to see what's going on, and we were under instruction not to eat beef there. So I got my chicken and cheese. And, uh, but what was traumatic for people, for citizens all over Europe, was to realize uh, this new farming uh, environment where you feed uh, cows uh, with leftover of dead cows. And people were not responsible because this was the origin of DSP, feeding uh, animals with leftover from dead animals. And uh, this time we were, everybody was shocked. What is this? This is not the agriculture that I, I can recognize. And uh, until it was in the UK, we were a bit shocked, but so far so good. But then we started to see cases in the rest of Europe, in Italy, in France, in Germany, and some people died over there. And then the, 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 really the panic uh, spread, uh, and the consumer basically confident for uh, government, the European Union collapsed completely, not only the big market. Immediately after that, we had an epidemic uh, of uh, classic Ocean fever, another highly infectious disease, not transmitted into human, but nevertheless terrible because basically we had to feed uh, all pigs in the Netherlands. And again, uh, second shock, what is this? Why we are doing that? What is this intensive agriculture? And with the timing that you cannot believe, Monsanto placed on the market the first uh, GM corn in Europe. After BSP, Frankenstein food. This was the title of the newspaper. So you, you can imagine the type of threat, crossing fish with strawberries. So <laughs> all together, people were really starting to get annoying uh, in, in a major way. We had then another series of crises which are not food related, but were part of the package. For example, this uh, highly decontaminated local season in France, where uh, France delayed uh, uh, the use of a, of a screening uh, to detect contaminated blood because the French test was not yet ready. So as a consequence, contaminated blood was transfused to, to patients uh, who got uh, HIV and other kinds. Unique in the history of the commission, in 99, the commission resigned. This was the cherry of the cake. It was the French commissioner, Madame Cresson, who hired her own dentist as advisor which you can say, well, there are worse things that happen. But this was a bit, as I say, the cherry of the cake. This commissioner was in any case linked to DSP, to metal disease, to all the uh, various other scandals, so he resigned. We had then uh, the dioxin crisis. I don't know if you ever heard about this. Uh, the story was that uh, on a Friday, they called me from uh, the Belgian uh, veterinary service, and they told me we found a huge level of dioxin in ants and chickens. And eventually, the reason was, once again, feed. Normally, you use uh, in feed for chicken and pig recycled oil 
the oil that you collect from McDonald's restaurants. But in this case, by fraud or by accident, they mix it with industrial oil. So all sorts of food were contaminated. Chicken, the chicken meat disappeared from the market, not only in Belgium, but all over Europe. And again, people were saying, that, where are we going? And finally, we had the food and mild disease outbreak in the UK. UK was just recovering from the snake cow disease. And we don't know how this uh, highly virulent virus entered in the UK. UK was not able to control it. It was a series of mistakes done. And it spread all over UK. Army had to, in to intervene. We had to kill uh, more than 3 million of animals. It was heartbreaking because, uh, as I say, these were small farmers. They know their cows one by one. And we were going there, shooting at them, and burning them on top because there was no incineration capacity anywhere. So you put on the television in the morning, BBC One, and you have this image, animals uh, burning in the field, uh, farmers in fear, suicide. It was really terrible, and this was the last straw. I mean, people were not eating beef, was not eating chicken. Uh, they were looking at us like we were criminals. So the answer was, uh, let's start from the very beginning of new food. This was uh, the white paper on food safety. We established uh, uh, a new kind of independent scientific body to uh, assess the risk, the European Food Safety Authority. We elaborate uh, this new legislation covering all aspects of food products, from farm to table, enhance official control, increase transparency to the consumer, and try to be more proactive at international level. <coughs> These are the basic principles, but I would like to concentrate mainly on uh, the principle of precaution. This is also giving you an idea of how complex this legislation has become as a whole. You will see there are big pieces of legislation which are affecting all the filières, from the agriculture to consumer, other than uh, are more uh, linked to a specific sector. But when we talk uh, about farm to fork, what do we mean? And I'm starting now to go into details uh, highlighting where the transatlantic divide is. The best example is our salmonella control program, where we see a decrease uh, of case of human salmonellosis, which is continuing, is a very big trend. And uh, we achieve the re result by applying hygiene from farm to the local house. This is the main big difference that we have between us. So we believe that to reach a good hygienic piece of meat, you have to work at the farm level, and then you should not use antibiotics for many reasons, and uh, you should, uh, at the processing plant, such as local house, respect hygiene. So we don't allow the contamination of meat. In the US, you do the opposite. You say, we don't sort of care mm. about hygiene at farm level. Because we use antibiotics if there is a disease. And we use it as growth promoters. So we use them extensively. And if something goes wrong, at the end, at the slaughterhouse, we decontaminate with chlorine, everything. This, of course, the famous bleaching uh, of meat. And this is something where the negotiation of the type is one of the first uh, moments in which the negotiation remains stuck, because it's a principle where we don't understand each other. For example, here you wash eggs. You know, you wash eggs. 
I, when I was uh, doing my study at that point, I, um, for my veterinary degree, I got IG in 101, basically, and they told me you shall never, ever, ever watch an ad. And I still don't know who's right, who's wrong. But I think that, uh, you know, we are talking about this sort of difference that uh, I don't know if they're going to be solved eventually. On in antimicrobial resistance, uh, just to, to emphasize that uh, we are banning uh, the use of antibiotics as growth promoter, mainly because of the problem of the antibiotic resistance. I know that in the US uh, you are concerned about this uh, as well. But we also found that if you apply hygiene at the farm level, you will not cure antibiotics because you don't need them. The animals are generally healthier. And this uh, is uh, the result. Um, the prevalence of salmonella in, uh, in uh, laying eggs in particular is uh, declining and the trend is continuing. So we are really reaching uh, our target and going beyond that. Back to the precautionary principle. Um, we have the perception that uh, it's all about science. As I said before, it's a principle that we apply when science uh, is uncertain. But in reality, when uh, we are taking measures based uh, on precautionary principles, we are also looking at other legitimate factors, other than science, which are these, ethical concern, um, subsidiarity, impact on local and traditional products. And this is not a European paranoia or invention is in fact uh, already included in the World Trade Organization agreement and in the Codex Alimentare. Nobody wants to go into this. It's a gray area. Um, ethical concern when you do legislation. So, so far the WTO, the trade partners, prefer not to have uh, a clear doctrine on this. But things are changing. Because last year we had the first uh, case in the WTO where that we won, it's one of the few, we keep losing panels in the WTO, but this we won, and it was about uh, uh, our ban to kill first and milk, I don't know if my pronunciation is correct, kill, marin, mamman, okay, you understand what I mean? So we took this ban for ethical reasons, basically, and the WTO uh, accepted it. So it's the first time that the WTO accepts um, that a ban on a trade has been uh, imposed uh, based uh, on ethical reasons, which is, uh, makes us very hopeful that animal welfare, for example, will be also accepted in, in future times. This idea of uh, um, prohibition that we have adopted, at least at the beginning, on the base of precautionary principles that in the US we don't have adopted and that are at the core of the discussion of the CPIP. So, as you know, we don't use hormones as growth promoter in meat. We lost panels and panels in the WTO. We pay whatever we have to pay but we are not going to go back on this issue. Uh, we are also banning beta agonists and including the famous rastopamine that in the US is extensively used uh, in pigs and the US is hopefully, uh, is hopefully trying to make us open the door to this substance. We don't <coughs> use antibiotics. We don't use uh, bovine uh, somatotropin which is uh, a hormone which increases uh, milk production by 20%, is also making the cow very, very unhappy because you can imagine to put push to produce 20% more. So this uh, uh, increases the risk of mastitis and therefore more antibiotics and therefore more residue in milk. This is why we ban it for welfare reasons above all. 
is our topic at the moment under negotiation, which U.S. put on the table for political reasons, but it's pretty clear that we are not going to move over that. Another big chapter for the negotiation is animal welfare. We have uh, the most severe and costly animal welfare rule in the world, and we are trying to convince our trade partners they should do the same. The results so far are not yet there, but we are not giving up. And uh, this is part uh, of the TTIP. I mean, what we are trying to do is to have included in this agreement at least the recognition that animals are sentient beings and therefore need to be protected. Our farmers, as you can understand, they're fine. They got used to us to animal welfare. They embraced it, but also because they didn't have any other option. But they are saying, well, that's fair enough, but what about the others? I mean, I, we, we are talking about uh, competitivity here. And indeed, uh, uh, we have a very complex legislation, but at the end, according to our calculation, it has increased uh, the cost uh, of 2%. So an egg here, from a conventional farm would cost what, 20 cents? 2% of 20 cents? I think consumer in the US would pay that cost of mining if they know that is uh, for a good cause. And it's not only about uh, being nice to the animal, but uh, well-treated animals produce more, they're healthier, so you will again you need less uh, antibiotics, less uh, medicaments. So two examples of what we have done, and we would like the US to follow us, and some uh, uh, of your states already are doing that. We, for example, ban uh, the use of non-enriched cages, the normal cages that are used for milk. Okay? So as from January 2012, all our laying eggs in Europe enjoy space, uh, nest uh, and they are happily living in uh, something like that. I live in worst place in my life. Mm -hmm. I mean, this obviously is the best in each cage. I pick up the best. But as you can see, laying hen can move around, uh, we establish the hierarchy, and the production increase, which is economically speaking, not a trivial uh, result. Another, uh, um, of course, economically important measure was about uh, the welfare of souls, where uh, we ban these horrible things, the farrowing rates, you know that uh, the poor souls spend weeks during pregnancy and after delivery completely blocked in a cage. They cannot move. They lay like that for weeks. So we ban it and we moved to group housing. And this was not uh, an NGO's uh, or, uh, you know, the cat ladies uh, who wanted this measure. These were the pig, the Danish pig farmers, which are the smartest <coughs> farmers in Europe, for pigs. <coughs> and definitely they are not some, someone uh, who will waste their money <coughs> for something where they don't see the benefit. They demonstrate to us and to all the member states that this humane way of raising animals is in fact paying back because animals, once again, are healthy, more productive, and uh, is a win-win situation. We are also ban, uh, we are trying to ban, uh, we have a moratorium, but we are going to make it permanent, animal cloning. Again, we are doing this uh, for uh, um, ethical reasons, because we don't see the point, and because uh, the technology is terrible towards anyone. I mean, for one clone that succeeds, uh, you have many others that don't. The poor Dolly, we all know Dolly, eventually die of lung cancer, put down, but he has a terrible life. 
and the situation is not uh, very much improved. Uh, the other reason why I personally don't like this technique uh, is that imagine that by an arrogant way you decide that this is the perfect cow and we clone, we clone, we clone, we clone, we clone and all over the world we have the same cow. And then we unluckily discover that this cow is genetically predisposed to get a certain disease. This happened already in the United States. In the 70s, you have uh, a virus affecting corn, and because corn was basically the same breed, all corn <coughs> was destroyed. So this is why I don't think it's a bright idea cloning in general. Of course, uh, conventional breeding uh, is also not innocent. So this is not a product uh, of GM or cloning. This is an unfortunate uh, breed, uh, which is rare in Belgium. It's called Belgian Blue. And uh, in, the, what was in the 19th century, a cow was born with this defect, um, where uh, it wouldn't stop replicating, producing muscle cells. So this is the result. The breed I found it was extraordinary to have so much meat uh, in one animal. Mm -hmm. But these animals are, again, a pretty nasty life. Because they are too heavy, the cows are too big, so you have to do cesarean instead of natural birth. And we are trying also to see if we can do also something to regulate uh, conventional breeding as well, because as I say, they're not really innocent. And of course, our favorite transatlantic device, genetically modified organs. I put this picture because it's awesome, but I can put video pictures because on a weekly or daily basis in Europe, we have uh, this type uh, of situation. I mean, GM in Europe, I don't think there is any hope. And this, uh, even if we have a pretty good legislation, I mean, all GMOs are uh, uh, authorized uh, by our independent uh, food safety authority. We have a labeling, so consumer choice. Uh, member states can also limit cultivation uh, uh, based on various uh, justification, they can take healthier measures. This is an example of labeling. It's also said wrongly because it's so rare to have uh, a GM product on the shelf that I think they don't even know how to spell it. Genetically <laughs> modified soybean oil. But this is the situation. As you can see, GM is basically <laughs> cultivated in the US in parts of South America, but the rest of the world, I'm sorry, is not following that. And is not going to follow that. So in Europe, we have uh, two pathetic GM allowed for cultivation. Only one is cultivated by five brave countries. Six member states, including France, apply Texas law, we prohibit cultivation to food. And we are so exasperated by the situation that we have a new proposal on the table where we tell member states, fine, do whatever you like. Uh, they will have the possibility in a very open and transparent manner to decide not to cultivate things. So at least we will not be forced to go to Geneva to defend the member states. They will take their own responsibility. But uh, it's not advancing the level perhaps because uh, member states prefer that the responsibility remain uh, with the uh, European Union. I've always been asked uh, why, why in Europe uh, we have this phobia uh, against uh, GM, why, why we are not embracing this technology. And uh, when I start uh, to work uh, on the GM dossier in Brussels, I was pro-GM. I said, but what a great idea. These GM are supposed uh, to allow us to use less pesticides and to use less herbicides 
and uh, so I was really trying to make a case for, for that. But this is what happens. In reality, we are using less herbicide, we are using less pesticide, and this is the result uh, of an independent study, but uh, uh, USDA, your own government, has reached basically the same conclusion. So the problem that we, we have in Europe uh, is that uh, as consumers, as farmers, we don't see the added value yet. And uh, we prefer to work uh, on a better use of pesticides. Uh, at the bottom you see that we have removed from the market 67% of pesticides um, through a review process. In the future, we don't see any GM, which is of particular interest for consumers of developing countries, uh, coming into the market. You heard about the golden rice, probably, this famous rice which is supposed to contain beta carotene. It's 20 years that the GM industry is telling us, wait to see the golden rice. That is going to change uh, the world. That is going to save uh, people in developing countries. It's nowhere. But on the other side, we have the scuba rice, which is produced by uh, the Institute for Rice Research, the Rice Research Institute, which is an independent uh, institute. Uh, and they, through a non-GM technique, manage to produce a rice that can withstand two weeks underwater. So very useful in country like uh, Bangladesh, but also Rome, because it's under flooding completely, uh, which are prone to flooding. So this is why uh, not only we are scared about the technology, but above all, uh, we believe uh, that the added value for consumer and farmer are not there. So in case you are asking. The, one of the last measures also that we adopted and which has been heavily criticized has been uh, a measure that uh, was uh, aiming to contrast the decline of bees. It's a multifactorial problem, but one of the problem uh, is pesticide poisoning. So here we are, we ban from 2013 three pesticides, the famous neonicotinoids and an insecticide. And I like this picture because, I mean, pets is the cheapest. It's telling you a lot about European pollution. I mean, we defend the interest of the cheapest. Find me another institution that defend the interest of the cheapest. How many votes bring the cheapest to a politician? None. <laughs> but you see, they're happy and we are happy. And I would like uh, to conclude, and I'm sorry if, if I spend so much time on Europe, but let's uh, have a look to the United States now. Is it so true that you are not using uh, recalculation? I, um, I'm not too sure. In fact, uh, there are ample evidence that the U.S. is indeed uh, adopted precautionary approach. It doesn't say it's precautionary principle, it doesn't use this word. But the reality is that there's been selective application of precaution to particular risk on both sides of the Atlantic. And this uh, is a list of examples. So the US is more risk adverse than Europe on other sectors, like uh, you see them, ozone depletion, carrier pollution, tobacco, terrorism, but even on uh, food safety, on medical disease, uh, you are more risk adverse than us now. You are still uh, impeding the export of European beef. Shame on you <laughs> in the US. Uh, you are still a uh, very strict legislation about uh, uh, blood transfusion. I think the British people cannot still uh, donate blood uh, in the US. Possibly a European, but I'm not sure. 
And uh, incredibly, you have uh, a zero tolerance for listeria monohistogeny in the pronunciation is wrong, which is a bacteria that you find in milk and cheese. I don't know what's happened. You must have some sort of uh, major outbreak in the past. And as us, the US has reacted by uh, taking a very risk adverse uh, attitude. At that point, that unique in the world, you had a zero tolerance. So you cannot have one listeria in your cheese. While in Europe, we are eating them by spoon. Also because uh, um, this is perfectly in line uh, with uh, the uh, tolerance established by the Codex Alimentarius. There is an e for, for who is interested in this subject, I highly recommend the book, uh, The Reality of the Calcium, who is precisely the making uh, a comparative study between US and EU. And uh, one of the author is Professor Wiener, who is teaching at the Duke University. And um, it's an extremely interesting uh, uh, book, very complete, uh, and uh, is elaborating uh, further on, uh, on this theory. So as a conclusion, I would say that uh, if you look at the broad range of risk, neither the US nor the EU can claim to be more precautionary than the other. And precaution should not be a dividing line, but a tool, sorry for this uh, lyric uh, wording, to bridge the transatlantic gap. But my hope, in fact, uh, for this uh, transatlantic partnership uh, agreement is that instead of fighting over hormones, GMOs, listeria, beef, we could really try to have a regulatory collaboration in a more transparent way and perhaps to tackle global risk together, pandemic, where us public authority are really not well prepared. So my wish is that these two major big powerful region of the world get together in this agreement not to get the chlorinated chicken uh, from one side of the Atlantic to the other, but really to pick up something of uh, major interest for consumers. And that's all from my side.